still on there, Marvin? You betcha. Good. Okay, we're Start gonna again. Start. I, I kind of listed at Mille Lacs in 1862 uh, different people that were pretty uh, involved in, in what was happening. And at Mille Lacs, you know, Shabashkin was the head of the Bullhead clan. And then Manomenik Kedizhik, the rice maker, that was Mazumane's father. And uh, Shabashkin always said that he really wasn't the leader at Mille Lacs, he was just holding it. And he took over when Nick Winabe had passed away in, in 1854, and then he took over leadership in 1855, and that's how he ended up being in Washington and making the treaty. Uh, there was a uh, Chicago Bay, he was a leader, and uh, he was kind of the war leader. I was going to. Just endless spellings of you know, the name of Zumane, and then Nekwanebi, and then Kegaduche. He was kind of like a headman. He was a warrior, but he wasn't a leader. And I don't know if we, there's still any of these copies around. It's a document that was prepared in. Uh, 1897, and uh, Alex Moose had it in a safe deposit box. And what was interesting about this document that Alex Moose had was that it talks about Chicago Bay. And if you read most of the histories around Mille Lacs, Chicago Bay doesn't come up, his name doesn't come up. And the first time I heard it, it was from George Abbott saying the war chief at Mille Lacs, Chagabe, wouldn't allow Mille Lacs to go to war in the, with the Dakota or with Poland today. And, uh, and then when this document was found by the, that Alex Moose had, he mentions Chagabe in there as a war leader. And so, it, supported that that concept back and forth. The other thing with Kegaduche that that uh, is an interesting is that the daughters of the American Revolution in nineteen fourteen went around and interviewed all the old settlers. And they interviewed a man down in Princeton named Gold. And he starts out his interview as, one of my best friends was Kegaduche. And that's this guy. And uh, he said, and he said, Kegaduche brother, same day, was killed by Dakota going up across the Rum River. And his wife got away. And he tells the story, the same story that Jenny Mitchell told, or Quay told me about this whole thing, except he even knew the guy, his brother's name. The same day was translated into English. Uh, and so they, it followed, the story followed very closely the same. And then he said that later that when as this conflict was going on at Princeton, they built a stockade. And they would just gotten it done, and they were all scared, he said. And he said, we looked up, and here Kegaduche stuck his head in one of the portals that we were going to shoot out of. And he said, he looked at us, and he said, oh, no good, won't help at all. <laughs> and then he told them that, you know, they were going to protect Princeton, too, from any kind of conflict. And uh, so it was, it 
it's uh, interesting how some of these stories get collaborated on as things go on and you hear about them and follow. And I just threw that picture in there of Shabashkin. And then this reference I wanted the people to be aware of. This is a monument built for Mille Lacs and uh, the, the Ojibwe or Chippewa. Uh, and it, it said it was erected for the, by the state of Minnesota in recognition and commemoration of the loyalty and the effective service rendered to the state of Minnesota by Mazumane and by the Chippewa Indians during the Sioux outbreak in the Civil War. This statue was dedicated in 1915 down at Fort Ridgely, and it still stands there. And uh, there was about 5,000 people came to the event in 1915 when they did the inauguration of this. One of the reasons we haven't heard a lot about this is that the people that wrote Minnesota history, particularly Falwell, William Falwell, he had a letter that said that no Chippewa would ever identify as a Dakota. And there was this confusion on the name of Mazumane because there was also a Dakota leader named Mazumane in 1862. And so it created some confusion about who was who. And so the, the history of Minnesota doesn't tell that story very well. And so that's why I think most of us have never seen this. And this is a, a, a picture taken at Little Falls in 19, 1880, and Mazumane is in this picture. And that's him right there with the stoke pot black hat though. And it's, I know it's really hard to see, but that fellow right there, that's Shaboshka. And this fellow right here, that's Nathaniel Richardson, the mayor of Little Falls. There, there were other people. There were other people involved with what was going on at, at crowing and preventing all of the day from really being able to muster everything he wanted. And one was a guy named George Sweet, and he actually negotiated a, a truce for four days with all in the day after he. 18th of August that gave everybody some time to, to deal with what was going on with the, the Ojibwe. And uh, I think we talked about the September 10th meeting and then Van leaves and then Ramsey tries to draft the state thing. And then the Lax Ojibwe joined the Minnesota 9th Regiment to serve under Sibley at Fort Abercrombie, uh, and then they go on into the Union Army. But they're out in Fort Abercrombie for a whole year. They're out there. And then I took Kirk Kelk and Jardine, my son, down, and this is the monument, dedication to the monument. They're both related uh, of a Zoom on a and uh, through there. And then the results of the conflict was that 
you know, the Lax Warriors volunteered, as we talked, and then they got rejected, and then they got incorporated into G Company, uh, the Knight Regiment. Hole in the Day's house was burnt down. Uh, and then in 1863, the Chippewa of the Mississippi were all brought back to Washington, D.C., and the government asked them to relinquish or succeed their reservations, the Chippewa and the Mississippi, and there was the exemption for the Mille Lacs non-removable. And when Crossing Sky and three of the other leaders got back, they were killed for signing that treaty of 1863. So it was a tragedy and and hostility because of things. Uh, then the government came back and did a second treaty in 1864. Um, the lax leaders weren't in attendance of that treaty, but essentially it's the language is very similar. Uh, the Article 12, which says, owing to the good conduct of the Mille Lacs, they shall not be compelled to be removed as long as they don't destroy the person's properties of the whites. Um, so that's, that all remains the same. And there's an additional clause added that says, the Sandy Lake Band shall not be removed. It's just that simple. And uh, so uh, that's was part of the 64 treaty. The other thing is, Holland today gets a new house. Uh, I think they sent, uh, set aside uh, $5,000 for a new house. The other thing that happened was that any deprivations that occurred, you know, to these government agents that were taken, or government employees that were taken, or any properties that was destroyed, like the church at Rabbit Lake was burnt. Um, the one in Gull Lake was burnt. Um, certain cabins and stuff that were destroyed. Um, out of the annuity funds, they had to pay for all of that. And there was a big rush for everybody to submit bills <laughs> to get money. And some of them may were very legitimate and some of them weren't. Uh, then the next thing that happens is that in 1867, the government creates the White Earth Reservation. So White Earth got created in 1867. There really wasn't a tribe living there. And so the reservation was the area where the Chippewa of the Mississippi were to be removed to. And the idea behind that, there was a couple of them. One was they felt that if they consolidated all the Ojibwe on one reservation, they'd, they'd be able to govern and have bigger input into things. And the second was that they were required to do that before they could see or make them leave the reservations they were on, the Chippewa the Mississippi. And the federal law required that they had to have a place to move tribal people to before they could move them. Otherwise, uh, they couldn't make the removal. And that came out of the, the results of the Trail of Tears with the Cherokee. They passed legislation that uh, did that. Uh, Hole in the Day got, he helped create the reservation in White Earth. And then he refused to let anybody move there. And there was a bunch of pressure to try to do that. Eventually, White Cloud, who was from up by, uh, oh, by Pillage, no, no, uh, by Emily, up by Emily in that area, he took, he took people and moved, moved to Whiter with about 300 people and moved to Whiter. And uh, all of the day said that he was going to shoot him when he tried to do that. And 
White Cloud said, well, he was a warrior too, and if that's what Hole in the Day wanted to do, then they, they figured that out. But Hole in the Day didn't go beyond saying it. And then in 1868, Hole in the Day was assassinated at Crow Wing. And there's a whole bunch of different ideas behind uh, why Hole in the Day was assassinated. Um, George Abbott felt that uh, the federal government had, had hired assassins to come and have him killed because they were just tired of it. Uh, Troyer says that he was shot because uh, Clement Bolio and some other people there at, at Crow Wing wanted to have him killed. Uh, because of his position against half breeds. Um, and one of the things that most people don't know that in 1864, when Holland they went to Washington, D.C., he took his nephew along and his nephew shot him in the neck. And he almost died. And uh, he ended up being in the hospital, and uh, it, the story goes that uh, all in the day told his nephew that he didn't deserve to have as many eagle feathers as he had, which was a sign of how many people you had killed. And his nephew took offense to that and shot him. Uh, but he survived, and uh, his nurse, he eventually married and brought her back to Minnesota. She was a non-tribal person and lived there at Bell Lake with him until he was assassinated. Also, one of the things that was happening in Minnesota was the logging, which was a tremendous industry that fortunes, people were making extraordinary fortunes off the lumber. And the 1837 treaty allowed the logging on the Rum River and St. Croix River and all these logging crews were coming up rivers cutting the timber. And by the 1870s, logging crews started to access pines on the shores of Mille Lacs Lake. And as you saw in the photo that uh, the reservation is only on the south and west side of the lake. So the north and the east side was all open for timber cutting. And so they cut timber and floated it down the, across the lake and then down the Rum River to Malacca and further down earlier to Anoka to have it sawed into logs. And a lot of Malacca's young men became log drivers. They drive these logs all the way down to Anoka. And uh, it was an extraordinary dangerous job and uh, a lot of them were hurt and killed. Um, but one of the problems was to get the la logs to float down the river, they had to dam up the river and create a backwash to wash them down. And so they built a dam at Onamia and uh, Lumbermen did that, and then the tribal members went there and tore the dam out, and the lumbermen came back, and then ended up a couple lumbermen got shot and killed. And then they went to the lumber industry, went to the governor, and asked him about uh, what could be done because they wanted them prosecuted. And uh, the governor basically said that if they went on on the reservation and, and were blocking their wild rice that they could be shot for that and uh, didn't pursue it and told the lumber industries that they had to go up and negotiate uh, use of the river if they were going to uh, float logs down it. So eventually they did, uh, I think Mille Lacs received a thousand dollars a year for 
damage is done to the rice field, that will name me in a leach because of the damming of the river. Similarly, in 1870s, there was a Civil War guy who moved up here with a soldier script. And the soldier script was that if you served in the Civil War, you could get 80 acres of land uh, free by claiming it. And uh, this soldier was named Robbins. His name was D. H. Robbins, and, and he came up here, and he was really a, a, a spy for the lumber industry, basically. Um, they got him this soldier strip, and they sent him up here and paid him to go out and survey the best pine lands on the reservation. And when, once he got it surveyed, then the, uh, the representative Fulstrom from Taylor's Falls filed, uh, I think it was 280 soldier scripts on the reservation claiming the best pine lands. And, uh, and then Fulstrom sent his son up here to get squatters rights up, up by Fort Malak by the golf course there. And he was going to live there over winter, and then he froze to death, his son, because he didn't have adequate housing. And so then he kind of dropped, Fulstrom dropped out of that, and uh, it, it sat there. And then the band was concerned about it because the governor of Pillsbury uh, said that there were people trying to take the reservation lands. And, uh, so that photograph of the 1880 photograph of Mille Lacs band members at Little Falls, uh, they went over to Little Falls and asked for support from Little Falls to help them deal with these claims. And so they wrote letters and sent off letters to Washington, D.C., and they got a congressional investigation into these soldier claims filed on the reservation. And in 1884, um, the, the soldier scripts were all found to be fraudulent. And so they were all canceled. And it really didn't affect anybody because there was no, no soldiers living here. But different people in Congress pushed that now you took these soldiers' land away from them. They didn't have any ability to do anything because you took their land away and you're hurting all these Civil War soldiers. It's kind of a script, you know, that, that politicians use to get their way with something that's really not based upon any factual situation. And, and so this congressional delegation disproved that there was that there was any valid soldier screams and they were all fraudulent. And then nationally there was the Dawes Act passed in 1887 and that's an important act for people to know about because the Dawes Act set up to privatize lands within reservations. It was called also called the Allotment Act. So this was the first attempt to allot the individual Indian people uh, land within the reservation and give them private ownership. Because in the, historically, all the land in a tribal reservation was owned by everybody in the tribe. And so the Dawes Act sought to break that up. And but what the Dawes Act really did was it said, OK, everybody's entitled to say on a given reservation, 40 acres of land. Each person will get 40 acres of land in the reservation. But that will only cover half of the reservation. They could have made it 80 and it would have covered the whole reservation, but they only give them 40 acres, so they only get half the reservation. And then they declare the other half of the reservation surplus land. And that gets opened up to settlement. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, I think Far and Away it was called. It was, uh, oh, I can't think of the actor now. Uh, it's 
kind of a famous actor, but it was down in Oklahoma where uh, they opened up the reservation and they had this land rush. It's all about the Dawes Act, what created all of that. So the Dawes Act was the first attempt and they felt that that would, you know, be beneficial, but the underlying motive was that tribes lost half of the land that they owned at that time under the Dawes Act. And in Minnesota, there was a man named Knute Nelson, who was governor, senator. He passed an act called the Nelson Act. And, the, and what he did, or what he said was that all, all the Chippewa in Minnesota, all the Chippewa in Minnesota, want to move to Whiter. And this act will provide money and, and resources for them to move to Whiter. And so he pushed this act, and then they would be given allotments on the White Earth Reservation. So he pushed this act, he was senator at the time, and Mille Lacs people heard about it, went out to Washington, D.C., and said, no, that's not what we want. So in the bill, then, they put a provision that required a vote a two-thirds vote of all the male members of the reservation to agree to move to White Earth before it applied to them. So the bill passed. Neither the House side nor the Senate side of that bill had anything about the soldier script in it. But in conference committee, when the bill came out of conference committee, those fraudulent homestead credits scripts were back in the law, so they became valid out of the conference committee. And guess who owned those soldier scripts? Nelson. <laughs> and then he sold them to Weyerhaeuser, and Weyerhaeuser sold them to Little Pine Logging Company, or was part of Little Pine Logging Company, which became company that bought or cut timber off the reservation. And just to give you an idea how much timber ultimately was cut off on the Lacks Reservation, uh, you could build a, a sidewalk six feet wide, one inch thick, start in New York, go to San Francisco, come back, and go almost to San Francisco again. That's how much lumber was cut off the reservation. Tremendous amount. Um, in the book that the band just put out, the, the Moccasin Telegram, there's a couple stories in there about timber on the reservation, how much volume it was. Yeah, it's just a tremendous amount of timber. There were people I talked to whose parents came they lived, they didn't live on the reservation, but they lived off, but their parents came through the reservation in the 1890s, and they said it was like a huge green umbrella when they got to the reservation because it hadn't been cut. The other thing that happened was there was something called the creation of the Chippewa Commission, and there was a Bishop Whipple Whiting and Henry Rice served on that commission, and they were recommending various things, and uh, one of their recommendations was to consolidate all of Ojibwe on one reservation. So that created some kinds of uh, incentives for the enactment of the Nelson Act. Even though that's not what tribal people wanted, that's what the bishops thought would be the best thing. And it also provided them with an option of having people consolidated so they could do their ministerial work too, I believe. When the, the lumber industry uh, didn't actually want to have Mille Lacs members removed under the Nelson Act uh, because they uh, they were using dried logs and so they 
there was letters and correspondence saying, do not remove Malak's people who got out there and get the logging done. So it wasn't done. Um, 1902, there was an appropriation of $40,000 for damages done, done to Malak's band members. Um, basically, what happened there was that there were immigrants brought in to the United States, and in particular in this region, um, Crozier Seminary in Oneida, that was orchestrated by something called the Volunteers of America. Calloway's Boys Ranch, that was Volunteers of America. Um, but Crozier would bring in immigrants from Belgium and other European countries and make sure they had money to buy land that was logged off. So the logging companies had the land so they could log it, and then after it was logged, they gave the land title to their children. And in this area, it was a guy named DBS Johnson Land Development Company, and he was married to Warehouser's daughter. And so he got this Volunteers of America going to bring in immigrants, and then they sold these immigrants land that belonged to the Malak's band members. And there's stories about how Malak's band members uh, had to go find interpreters to talk to these immigrants because they couldn't speak English. They could only speak like Norwegian or, or German or something. And so they had to find interpreters because they were living in their houses. If they went off in the fall for hunting, these guys would move in, and then they'd come back, and then there'd be somebody living in their house. And, and all of this was a problem, and, and that's why ultimately they appropriated this $40,000, because there were so many of Ben's houses taken by these immigrants that didn't know what they were getting into when they were brought over here. And that, that was a bigger problem than everything else because now you had all these extra people in the reservation claiming title to lands. And the other part of the Chippewa Commission that existed there, uh, in the Nelson Act, it consisted of Bishop Whipple, Whiting, Reverend Whiting, and Henry Rice. And so they negotiated the provisions of the Nelson Act. And those provisions included, when they got the Mille Lacs, Mille Lacs said no, they didn't want to move to White Earth, and no, they didn't want to accept the Nelson Act. And, and that they had to leave because they ceded their reservation in 1863 and 64. And so they called Henry Rice on the carpet for that, saying, now that's, you know better than that. You know you were there at the writing and the signing of those treaties. You know that's not what was true. And finally, Henry Rice admits that that was true, that the band did have the right to stay. Um, and then he convinces them that what they really wanted was just the pine, so if they agreed to sell the pine, they could stay on the reservation and that they could take their allotment on the Lax reservation. And each person would be given 40 acres of land. And I figure at the time there was probably 1,500 band members, so they would have covered the whole reservation with allotments if they had been allowed to take them, which Henry Rice said they were. Different people, when I first came here, would talk about Henry Rice, and they'd call him White Rice. And, and they'd say, White Rice the liar. That that's how they referred to him. Uh, so it was a very difficult time. Um, one of the things that uh, band members were concerned about was that when these negotiations were going on with 
that they watch the leaders. They had people set guards in front of the leaders' tents so that nobody could get in there and try to manipulate what was being agreed to. It was that tense of a situation. And so when everybody agreed finally that they would be allowed to take allotments on the Mille Lacs Reservation, and then they moved on to the next reservation, you know, Sandy Lake. Well, actually, they never went to Sandy Lake. They went to White Oak Point at Leech Lake and different parts of Leech Lake. They went up to Fond du Lac, Net Lake. There was a reservation called Deer Creek Reservation up by Net Lake. That's gone. Um, and, and they were all consolidated. Then we moved to Whiter. So the Nelson Act was a was a very difficult act for the Ojibwe. Uh, Nelson himself was a pretty awful guy, actually. Uh, he was campaigning on White Earth Reservation, and they got so mad at him, they threw him off the podium. And, uh, but he got elected governor for a term, and there's a statue for him down in St. Paul in front of the Capitol, and uh, there's an effort going on right now to get him taken down, and <laughs> pull that one down. So, you know, he hasn't quite survived his, his, uh, his status yet. But, uh, but nobody knows about how corrupt stuff he had done. You know. In particular, I think, those fraudulent soldier scripts there's a pretty good documentation that, you know, that there was a huge congressional investigation looking at these soldier scripts and how fraudulent they were. And, and then to have a conference committee come out, neither bill on either side in the House or the Senate had that soldier script mentioned. And then they came out and the bill was in there validating those soldier scripts and then Newton Nelson had bought him up by that time. It was, it was really a, a corrupt, corrupt system. So that brings us up to 1900. I want to see what, what the next. Yeah, the next one we'll try to do 1900 uh, about. I think in the 1970s, take us through that 70 year period, and then, uh, then the final one will be between 1970 and probably 2005 or somewhere in that area. You guys missed 